So let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, impingement and uh, rotator cuff tears and how we rehabilitate the patients. Some of this you've uh, heard from Giovanni. Um, Nir initially uh, talked, coined the term impingement syndrome, talking about the repeated mechanical insult uh, to the rotator cuff by the coracoacromial arch. And he said that this was a result of bone spurs in the anterior third of the acromion at the CA ligament attachment. And he gave us the stages, which uh, the stage one was in younger patients, and then stage two, a little bit older, and then over the age of 40. Those are the patients that were in stage three. And we <clears throat> learned the types. Actually, this was, this was never published. This was published as an abstract, but it's never, it was never published in a judge journal. Um, but those are the three types of uh, acromions. And the, the names that eventually got put on this were subacromial impingement, primary impingement, external impingement, and extrinsic impingement. And this slide is a slide that was being used by Frank Job when I was a fellow um, many years ago. Um, but in 1932, Codman talked about what would, we would now consider secondary impingement, <clears throat> which is uh, associated changes in the supraspinatus causing changes in the subacromial bursa. And Matson and Harriman showed us that with intrinsic supraspinatus degeneration from aging or vascular compromise or overuse, there would be a relative weakness of the rotator cuff in relationship to the deltoid, and there would be a superior pull of the deltoid causing impingement. And then Frank Job talked to us about uh, anterior superior impingement because of anterior subluxation in throwers and the confusion in, uh, in apprehension and apprehen with his apprehension suppression or relocation test. And then Matson and Harriman talked about posterior capsular contractor producing anterior superior translation, but they talked about it only in flexion. Well, more recently, a lot of people have been talking about scapular dyskinesis with anterior tilt and internal rotation of the scapula with elevation, and that, in fact, is where I see most of my impingement syndromes coming from. So what will get, contribute <coughs> excuse me, to a scapular dysfunction? Well, pretty much anything in the kinetic chain. Weaker dysfunctional scapular musculature, we talked about pec minor, <coughs> excuse me, we talked about postural problems, we've talked about cuff, Biceps tendonitis, subacromial bursitis, glenohumeral instability, GERD, labral pathology, chondral surface problems, proximal kinetic chain abnormalities, AC, SC instability. So pretty much anything along the kinetic chain can contribute to scapular thoracic dysfunction, which will cause impingement. So is impingement a true diagnosis, or is it just a description of symptoms that basically come down to anterior shoulder pain? Well, the goal of functional rehabilitation, as we talked about earlier, was to reestablish normal function. And again, another yogiism, if you don't know where you're going, you may wind up somewhere else. So you've got to know what you're going for as you're going through the rehabilitation. You want to correct the soft tissue restrictions early. We talked about this earlier, proximal stability before distal mobility, core and alignment, and the other things. I just wanted to make sure you didn't forget things over the coffee break. So here are rehab considerations in general. No matter what we're talking about, these are the considerations. When we, in the shoulder, when we talk about postural alignment, we want to talk about scapular position. And I differ in my approach that from what Matt just described because I want the scapula in position before the surgery if possible and immediately after the surgery, so we start scapula stabilization exercises immediately post-op. And then we'll strengthen it later on. We talked about scapular position facilitating rotator cuff function and decreasing position and decreasing pain. <clears throat> and then there are closed chain and open chain uh, exercises that we talked about. And here for the, for the scapular stabilization, if you put, have the patient put their hand against the wall, that's closed chain. And you want the patient to be able to n know and tell you where they are on the scapular clock. So you can tell them you want them to stop it at 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock so they know how to position it so that you're uh, asking the patient to essentially find their scapula. If they can't find their scapula pre-op, they're going to have a lot of difficulty finding it post-op after an incision has been made. And you want to think about the position that the patient has a problem. So here's that thrower that I showed you that was doing the single leg squat. And his problem was that his scapula was too low. Well, having him retract and depress his scapula is not going to be the right thing to do. So you really want him to be doing what, you would, be, what would be like a VMO contraction <clears throat> involving the upper trapezius. So for the leg, you do very short arc quads, and for the shoulder, you might want to do very short arc 
eccentric and concentric exercises to position the scapula. So not all scapular rehabilitation is the same. You've got to look at where is the scapula starting out and what do, I, what do you have to correct. We use biofeedback quite a bit. We use it to inhibit the upper trap if we need to and to um, enhance the function of the, or let us know when the lower trap is firing. We use dual mirrors in our clinic so that the patient is um, facing one big mirror and behind him is another mirror so he can see what he's doing, hear what he's doing because there's a little buzzer on the uh, biofeedback and he's also getting a, a, a signal. The phases that I look at are teaching the patient to isolate the muscles, correcting the malposition or malalignment, and that's reestablishing the length that we talked about earlier. Then you want to train the muscles in a muscle groups in a coordinated and synchronous pattern, and then reestablish normal functional patterns, proprioception, and the sensory motor training that I talked about earlier. In the isolation phase, you want to correct posture and the position of the scapula. That's the key. Um, you want to restore muscle balance, address the, any uh, hypomobility, especially thoracic hypomobility. Uh, focus on neuromuscular control, again, scapular awareness, um, and work on scapular humeral rhythm. So what are the things that we teach patients when they first come into the office? We have them do a sternal lift. If they do a sternal lift, just because of the shape of the thorax, you're going into thoracic hyperextension, the scapulae have to go into position. You really don't want the patient to pull their shoulder backs, which is what their tendency is. You just want them to do a gentle sternal lift. And, that, and you can, what I tell the patients to do, uh, the patients that work at the computer, talking about the re-evolution of, of posture, is their chest should not be facing the keyboard, their chest should be facing the monitor. When they're driving, their chest should be facing the, the um, windshield, it shouldn't be facing the, the pedals. So that's something they can do a lot of exercise frequently. You know, I don't have an hour to do it, but you sure as heck have one minute 60 times a day. So when they're sitting in the car, when they're sitting at the computer, they can be cueing themselves. We have, this is uh, what Ben Kibler calls the robbery exercise. It's basically scapular uh, retraction. Um, he starts out with the elbows lower. This is robbery number two in Ben Kibler's uh, progression. But look at, look at his problem, approximately. He's really lordotic you could probably put a cup on his rear end. He's a former pitcher. He's got a really bad psoas problem. Um, 